Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for inviting us. Um, it's been wonderful to be invited here with our fantastic team from different places in the world. You'll meet them all in a few minutes. Um, we've just been to run an experiential training course um, earlier this week, which we will talk about a little more later. And then we've come to this visionary conference, which brings together this, the science of the intervention triangle in a way that I think is very exciting for mental health. Secondly, I'll say a little note about our title. Although we will be talking about the tradition and legacy of therapeutic communities and the wider scope of what we now call enabling environments, it's actually a look at what we've been doing in the UK and Italy and India in the last few years to cope with the pressure of modernization in health service and mental health services so that hopefully we have a future as well as a past. So the next thing I'm going to do is introduce the team. I am Rex Haig. I'm a consultant medical psychiatrist, med sorry, consultant medical psychotherapist in the British National Health Service, which means I'm a psychiatrist who is also trained as a psychotherapist. And my own psychotherapy training is as a group analyst. And I've met several group analysts from Portugal and very, you know, it feels very much I'm amongst friends here with the group analysts. So a special welcome to the group analysts amongst you. I am, I am one of you as well. But here are my longtime friends and colleagues who are going to be um, talking with me. First we have, oh no, hang on, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Veronica first. Veronica? Yeah. Veronica will introduce herself later. Veronica is a member of our team who has just been doing the experiential training. With us. She, Veronica comes from South America, so she is very glamorous. Glamorous. Oh, yeah. Glamorous. Yeah. Sharma is even more glamorous because she comes from the mysterious East. Sharma comes from India, from southern India, and she will be talking to us. She has just done a talk um, in the other room, and this will be some more information from, about what they are doing in India uh, to develop the, these modern ways of, ther of therapeutic communities in mental health services. And then we have... Uh, Wait a minute. Then we have Aldo. Yes. Who is here? Aldo comes from Rome in Italy, although originally from Sicilia. But he is not part of the Mafia, but he is a good <laughs> friend of ours for many years. So we are going to be presenting the talk. We also have on the list Jan. Jan Lee's here. And Jan, unfortunately, has had to have new knees for her operation. She was hoping to come, but isn't, um, is not mobile enough yet to be able to fly in the airplane. So I will be talking about the bits that uh, Jan was going to talk about. Okay. So when I talk about therapeutic communities and needing to change, I always get some people telling me that, that I've sort of sold out. I'm, I've, I've, thrown away, I've thrown away the precious thing that we should not mess about with. So in the large group at um, last year's conference in the UK, I remember we had some some very sort of passionate discussions about the fire in the belly about therapeutic communities, about the, the, the energy that drives us. And that is what it needs to be, I think. And we mustn't let that fire in the belly, that excitement, that energy, that passion for the way of working in groups that we have, we mustn't let that, that be put down or put out or stopped by the way we have to do things in a modern environment at the moment. So some people say, you're, you, are a dy you, are, um, you have to be exciting, you have to be passionate. But other people say, we are dinosaurs in therapeutic communities. Oh, hang on, no, not him. Dinosaurs. <laughs> we are dinosaurs. We, we uh, come from a bygone age. We are old hippies. We are hopelessly romantic. We are out of touch. And, and most of all, this man says we are an evidence-free zone. We do not have scientific evidence to prove that we work, but I want to demonstrate to you today that that is changing, that is, that is wrong. This man is Tim Kendall, who is the director of the uh, National Health Services Mental Health. So he is in charge of all mental health in, in England, and I remember him saying in the corridor of the Royal College um, about five years ago, he said, therapeutic communities, evidence-free zone. And so that might be a little bit worrying. So we have the might and the majesty of the National Health Service. They say we're not serious about evidence. And then we have on the other side, 
the therapeutic community, radicals and hardliners, saying that we have, we've lost the plot, we've lost the, we've lost the feeling of it if we start talking to, about the way we need to change things, about the way we need to modernize. The trouble is, I think, although this sounds like an impossible position, we're being pulled this way and we're being pulled this way, I quite like that, and I think that's a good position to be in, sort of impossible position, something sort of like this, because I believe in both points of view. I believe that therapeutic communities need to do something different from what we've always been doing, maybe as well as what we've always been doing, and that we're not very good at thinking about that because we're committed to preserving this very sort of impressive and powerful treatment method that we already have. <coughs> so what I'm saying to you, and I'm going to say it to you in different ways this morning, is we need to be more willing to adapt and change, but I also think that it's very important to keep something that a lot of modernizations in uh, health services uh, don't, don't take any account of. And what it is that we need to keep, and that others might not take so much account of, is about things that are very important to us. Things like relationships, things about continuity of care, things like feeling of emotional safety, of not being disempowered or becoming an industrial process. Um, we're allowed to act in an authentic way from, our, from, our, from ourselves. And I dare say it's also, I think, about being playful and having fun in what we do. So it is not all serious. So where I'm hoping to get to uh, in this talk is the idea that we need to sort of leapfrog over this idea of modernization. Here's modernization, all modern things. And we get to something better that is beyond modernization, really. And it's much more real and authentic about relationships, and it's human, and it, it is not sterile or minimalist or cut down to the bone, reduced by money and everything uh, that we're so used to, which is the, the new public management is one of the words we have for that process at the moment. And that has changed the nature and the ethos of public service in, in the UK at least. So it has become a commercial enterprise rather than a human enterprise. And I think we have to be a human and, and um, a passionate sort of feeling enterprise, not just a commercial and economic enterprise. Uh, people used to be proud to work in the National Health Service in the UK, but now they just, they often feel anxious and desperate and wanting to retire because of the way that modernization usually is done to people. So I'm proposing that we have a different answer from therapeutic communities and that we can perhaps outmodernize or postmodernize even the most progressive ideas of our colleagues, we can get, move into a, a sort of world where relationships are what matters more than, more than money and economics and industrial processes. So we need to change more than we've ever thought possible to change, really. And because we've been doing many of the right things for years, like a democracy in our mental health services, like involving service users, we could be really good at this. And I think that is actually more fun than being part of traditional TCs and trying to do everything the same. If we keep the ideas and the spirit alive and do new things with it, I think that is a very sort of exciting way to work in the future. Now, my next few slides are a diagram, and it's about a difficult world, the difficult world we live in nowadays. These include financial trouble leading to cuts in mental health services, increasing regulation and administration, reduced scope for creativity and spontaneity, and less freedom to work in ways, um, in, in ways that we can express ourselves openly. Behind all this are forces beyond my full understanding, things like globalization and neoliberal economics and huge social and political changes. But I suspect there's this fundamental fear of others and lack of trust in relationships. So I hope that, a men that mental health will almost become a social movement to try and articulate something that has been lost in this industrialization, globalization process. And that's what we're trying to say from the world of therapeutic communities. What I'm going to tell you about is what we've just been doing in the UK to cope with these pressures and survive and hopefully thrive and grow as a movement. They're all about modernizing or adapting to the world around us so that we don't get killed off so that we don't die in a, like in Darwin survival of the fittest unless we are fit we will not survive but, but we're doing modernization in a way that respects the therapeutic community values the way that we've always worked and the things we believe in 
uh, underneath. So there's four different areas I'm going to spend a little time on uh, in each. And it's about surviving and thriving uh, rather than being modernized in a way that, that kills off our spirit. So the first one is that we need, to, we need to know what we're doing and doing it well. Quality improvement, so that is number one here. And we've been doing that in Community of Communities for the last 13 years uh, with our colleagues in Sicily, we've been doing it more recently, um, and, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. That is the, the thing that Jan was going to talk about today, but as I say, Jan is not able to come. She's, she was in the very beginning of this project when she wrote an audit tool for the British prisons, which has now been developed and taken up by therapeutic communities elsewhere. The second thing we need to do is we need to show that it's working, and we need to produce research evidence, and it needs to be this research evidence that's the right sort of research evidence for people who run and pay for health services. That is, that, oh sorry, number, that's number three. Number two is training. Training, we need to offer training which conveys the unique experience of the importance of relationships that we have in therapeutic communities. That's a difficult thing to describe without experiencing it, but we'll be talking about that in more depth in a few minutes. And the last thing we need to do is we need to be willing to do new things, do things differently, and spread the ideas beyond therapeutic communities, and join up with other people who have a similar sort of therapeutic philosophy. So the four themes today are going to be about quality, about training, about research, and about innovation. Sharma and Veronica are going to help us explain some of the things about the training. Um, it, it's Sharma about what's happening in India, and Veronica about what, what it's really about, this training. Um, which the training is, um, is the, the course we did at the beginning of this week, the living learning experience, for those who have, have heard of it. Who was at the living learning experience? There's a few people there. Uh, all sat together, that's very true. That's good group cohesion, I like it, I like it. Um, and, and this is a course we've run in different places and you'll be hearing about that in a few minutes. And Aldo will present some results from some, uh, some, a survey that we've done about the training to show, that, show what sort of environment it is. So I will start with um, the quality, talking about quality. This is where we started with um, Community of Communities. Yep. This is where we started with Community of Communities in 2002. The method we wanted to use was going back to the traditions that were at the beginning of the Association of Therapeutic Communities in the 1970s. So it's, it's 40, 45 years old, the ideas, but we were doing them in a way that was modern and TC friendly, a way that was accepted by the big organizations and institutions that we need to be taken seriously by. 40 years ago, the idea was that therapeutic communities would visit each other and, and then pick up ideas and share what they were doing um, and generally feel less isolated about the way they were working. Just by having visits, I think it was uh, one Saturday every three months, the community would open its doors and invite all the other members to come to the community and they'd have a big, a big dis day of discussions and showing around and talking about it all. In other words, the whole thing was about building relationships on a wider level, relations between people in different communities. The modern version of that, so that was what was happening 40 or 50 years ago, the modern version we started 14 years ago, and that was incorporating the idea of quality standards, so we could be fairly objective and have the authority behind it of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And the standards that were used um, for the quality network were democratically developed using TC principles. So every community had input into deciding what the standards were about what therapeutic communities should be doing. This meant that everybody was involved in the discussion and the agreement and voting on the first version of the standards. And so we as TCs felt that we owned the standards and they were meaningful to us. And that, that not that there were some persecutory instructions coming from the government telling us how we had to work we owned those standards because we had built them together. And uh, because in other quality inspection processes, certainly in the UK, I don't know about Portugal, other inspection processes can feel very much that you are uh, being, uh, you're, you're being told you are bad, you're not doing it right. Whereas this is a process to help people understand each other and develop different ways of doing things. And again, it's all about building relationships but it's also building relationships in a way that is accepted as a formal audit, a recognized quality improvement. 
a way for TCs to feel that they're not isolated and that they, they know that they're sort of doing it right or doing it good enough. So then we had to become comfortable with language like sharing best practice and benchmarking and action planning. And the modern thing that we were doing was called quality improvement, but we were doing it in a therapeutic community way that we could live with and we felt we owned and understood. Several other British quality networks in mental health have used many of those ideas themselves, like how to co-create a process with the service users being com completely involved themselves as well as the clinicians and staff. So I would maintain that just by being therapeutic communities and believing in the central importance of relationships, we'd also produced something that was more meaningful than a treatment manual, like for dialectical behavior therapy or cognitive therapy, more meaningful than that. But also we had bought a bit of a Trojan horse, a bit of a, um, a, a sort of a thing that might cause disturbance and make the system think, a Trojan horse, and we were spreading a message of gentle gentle subversion and quiet revolution about relationships and psychodynamics into the dry and technical world of the Royal College of Psychiatrists and the people who in, impose the, the rules and regulations on us. Now the standards and processes I've been talking about, they're all available on the website, uh, which is here, I think. Here's the, the website of it. And versions of these standards have now been adapted and are being used in in Australia, in Sicily, and in other parts of Italy. So that's the first of my four themes, which is about quality, and how we have to do quality in a way that's acceptable to us in therapeutic communities, but is also acceptable to the very strictly regulated world that we now live in. The second of my themes is training. And um, this is really the living learning experience that I'm going to talk to you about, the training that we've just done um, this week in Estremoz. There's something about the atmosphere or culture of a TC that's very difficult to put into words in any language. It's about this quality of relationships, the way people are with each other, that's experienced almost in a pre-verbal or a non-verbal sort of way. Books or lectures or theory can try to explain it, but they can never recreate that experience itself. People who have personal therapy might get some idea of it, perhaps especially if it's in a group, but this still doesn't give a realistic experience of what it's like in a therapeutic community. The rough and tumble and the everyday and the ordinariness and the fact we wash up together and eat together and play together and have serious groups together. People who are trained in psychoanalysis or existential psychotherapy will probably have some idea of it, but not that continuous sort of edginess or that continuous hurly-burly of what's going on. So this, this experience for staff of being in a therapeutic community themselves is something that we've now been doing for 22 years, I think, and we call it the living learning experience. It's a three-day course that we run as a therapeutic community 15 to 25 people who come as um, participants and we usually have three, four, five staff doing it. In England we run it in a large house on an organic farm, it's a, a study centre. And to run the courses we have about 15 um, staff members who take it in turns to, do, to be on the staff team. And most of those are English but there are uh, others as you'll as you meet from different countries. And we take it in turns to do the courses. And again, there's details on our website, which I think is, this is the uh, Booking Insight, that's the, the web address for the, for the courses, which um, I also have some information about, which I will leave at the conference here. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Veronica, who is going to talk to us a little bit about what it's like and show us some pictures of the different, um, the different places we work. Much better in the picture. I was younger than... Okay, are you going to show? Okay, we are showing some pictures about um, previous experiences. Okay, yeah. This is in Kent. In Kent. We usually have a final picture with all the group together, with all the happy expressions after the lovely experience we have lived. So we want to have a memory of that moment all together. Which is the next one? The picture? 
Okay, pay attention to this one. So uh, this is picture. There are just pictures or a little video of what could happen in a therapeutic community in a living learning experience. What we do in the living learning experience is to reproduce the most we can uh, therapeutic community environment that is therapeutic for members, clients, patients, they have different names in different situations. We usually call them members. The important thing of this picture, and that's the, the reason we wanted to show to you, is I want to make an ask, um, ask you a question. Did you notice who were the staff and who were the members? Did you notice the difference? No? Anybody with a something that says staff, something that says, well, that is the most important things in the community. There is no such a difference in the day-to-day -day living and learning together. We live together and we learn from each other. We have different roles and we are aware of the roles and we respect the roles, but we are not rigid about them because we try to be human beings first of all and try to understand the other one and make the other one to understand us as well because we as staff sometimes we forget that we are human beings that we have problems that we have sorrows that we have pains that we have joys and uh, we don't leave that at home all the time when I, we are working sometimes we come with this baggage to our workplace and, uh, and we try to hide it away and, and when, time, when, we try, when we hide them it's usually very unsuccessful and the patients feel or the members feel that there's something going on with us and that is not healthy for the running of the community so we try to be open if we are feeling bad we say well I'm feeling bad and so maybe somebody can help, and usually gets, gets a lot of help from the members. And from the colleagues as well, because it has to be a balance in the everyday living, learning together in the community. I see a lot, some faces here that have done the last workshop with us, so I would like to ask you to say something about your experience because this experience should be a living learning experience together. I don't think I have to be here saying everything. When you have lived your experience with us and you are living experience with us, that maybe you can share with us how you are feeling this moment or how you felt the moment in the living together workshop. Would you like to say something? Any one of you? Come on, be brave. Yeah. Everybody can hear her? Or do you need a microphone or you come here? Close to me then. Um, hello, my name is... It is? Uh, my name is Monica Silva. I'm from the Portuguese Group Analytic Society. Uh, I'm doing my training in group analysis and my group analysis, my personal group. And uh, I think I have a different uh, experience uh, comparing to the other members of the living and learning experience because I've, I've used to be in a group. 
um, but that was really different from what I'm used to. Uh, the living and learning experience, uh, I saw people who were afraid of being in the groups. Uh, and uh, uh, I think it, it is better to be in a community at uh, time and then in small groups instead of, I can compare it to the Congress I've been in. Uh, in the Congress, we, in, uh, we have groups, small groups and large groups, and I think it's harder to be there. For me, at least, it's harder to be in a, in a large group than instead of a small group, maybe because of my experience. But um, I think it's, it's kind of uh, um, cozy to be there with, uh, with those people, and uh, we feel really part of it. And for me, as I have told in the, the last large group, it was really good for me to be there because um, it was good for my identity as a group panelist to, um, to, to be a part of the group, the group in, in a large sense. Um, it really made me feel uh, like, how can I say this? It really made me feel like, like I, uh, I belonged to, to a, a group thing. Uh, you're understanding what I'm saying because I know in that. So, uh, that's what I felt. Okay. I don't know if someone else wants to speak. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, um, living and learning experience in the therapeutic community is a place where people live together. There are some basic rules that we have to respect, and then all the other rules are made together, discussed together. The responsibility of the running of the going on of the community is shared uh, within the mem with the members and the staff. Is we decide together what we want to do within a frame where we give basically a very strong structure of the frame. At the beginning of the day we have a meeting, at the end of the day we have another meeting and then what happens during the day we have to decide together. We have a small groups to reflect together what is going on, we cook together, we organize going out, study sessions, stay at home, whatever individual needs could be, share with somebody else, look for support. And that's it, basically. I, as a staff, in the living learning experience, usually learn a lot. And I think that is part in, very important as well. Don't forget our role is to be part of the structure and to help to keep the structure strong and firm, but we are learning as well. And for that reason, we should be grateful. With, I am grateful here towards you because you are listening to me. Uh, in my working situation, I'm grateful to the members. And usually in life, I'm grateful for everything. So, moto obrigada. One of the things that happens here, and perhaps only in this way, workers really come to understand what their patients and clients and service users feel when they, have, when they go into a therapeutic community. They have to make decisions about what to do together, to have small groups with strangers when they live in the same house with them, to make meals for each other, and to have fun and play together as well. And then on the third day, which was yesterday, no, it was the day before yesterday, wasn't it? No, it was Wednesday, yeah. On Wednesday, we all have to say goodbye to each other. And that's quite difficult in some ways. And my experience as a staff member is it's extraordinary how far people can come and, and, and join this group and feel that sense of sort of attachment and belonging and emotional safety in such a small period of time. So I think it's a very um, profound experience for people. There's certainly a great privilege of staff as well. Now... The next thing we're going to say is how these courses, although we've developed them in England and Italy, and now we've done one in Portugal, um, Sharma's been doing them in India for some time, and it's the same wherever we do it. The same things happen. And Sharma's going to explain that, um, about what happens in India here. 
And so here is Sharma, and here is Sharma. Now I'm going to change the, uh, the, the slideshow. There's a different slideshow for this one. Hi everyone, I am very grateful to Joao and to the committee to inviting me, for inviting me here and it's a privilege to be on the days with all the experts from the therapeutic community. So, very pleased to be here and very pleased to share some experience from India about the training program that we've been talking about for so far, the living learning experience. So what do I want to tell you today? Two things. One, that we do exist. And where is it that we exist? In Bangalore. And when we talk about, when I talk about we, I talk about the organization, Hank Nunn Institute, which basically is working towards developing treatment awareness and training programs for mental health in India. So living learning experience, the training program becomes a significant part of our work in India. And the second thing I want to tell you is just a few facts, interesting facts, about the LLEs in India. So we've, perhaps, this is the first LLE that we've done in India. I'm sure that, uh, is it too loud? No, no, no. Okay, all right. Perhaps it's also the first LLE in the Southeast Asia because we've not heard of any other training programs that have happened anywhere close by. And when I talk about an experiential program for mental health field, for psychologists, for psychiatrists, this is the first experiential learning program that we have back home. So you see pictures of arrival of the community room, of the garden areas that are there, some cooking, the dog, which is also a very important part of the community there, and bonfire, which has now become a ritual for every social community time that we have in the evenings. Fact two is that it happens in the middle of nowhere on an organic farm. And this place was basically a training center for women, which was not been used for five years before we did the first LLE. So when we arrived, our experience began with actually trying to organize the structure in a way where participants could live. Although it's not luxurious, it's very rough in nature and I think that's what gives the participants a feel of being grounded. We do have some members that accompany us on the LLE without any invitation. Monkeys and lizards, scary lizards, disgusting lizards. And monkeys where Rex has had a first-hand experience when he was just walking out of the doorway. There was a monkey who snatched bread from his hand. So that accompanies the living learning experience in India. When we began, we only had one qualified staff member when we did our first LLE in September 2015, and that's Anando Chatterjee, who has done a few LLEs with Rex and the entire team, and he's the staff member for the international LLEs. So at that time, because we wanted to start the program and we couldn't afford to get anybody from the international team back in India, what we had to do is myself and one more person jump in as a staff with minimal experience of having done one LLE as a participant. And the other person who accompanied me was an expert by experience, somebody who had been on the other side, had experienced what it's like to be in a therapeutic community for treatment, and this is our LLE staff team today. So from then on, we've made it a point that every part of our service, at least 50% of the faculty that we have, of the staff that we have, are people who are experts by experience, are people who have lived what it is like to have a mental health problem or a mental health issue or, have, or has had a diagnosis. So there's Anando, who's also the co-founder of the organization. Madhura and Maitri are two experts by experience, and Jayashree and myself are psychologists. So we all have done at least one LLE with the team, which gives us the minimal qualification to run the programs. 
and we are now in the process of developing a criteria or eligibility criteria so that we can expand our staff team keeping in mind all the required qualifications so we've managed to do five LEDs in one year with the resources that we have that's the first one that we did the second one was when Rex Haig, Sandra Kelly and Jan Lees came down to do it for professionals and that became a part of our qualification for the staff team. The third one in December. In April. And in August. This was only in the August LLE that we discovered there was a broken slide in some part of the farm. So where we managed to take a group photo. One of the things that has been very characteristic of the LLEs in India is that with my knowledge of all the LLEs that happen in UK, Italy and Australia, I understand that this is the only LLE with 76% student participation. We started our LLEs with having students as our participants and everybody seemed to come with an expectation of wanting theoretical knowledge. But what we found at the end when they left was that everybody had sort of acknowledged and recognized the importance of personal work, personal therapy for themselves as professionals, which is sad to say a strange idea in the context that we come from. So it helped us reinforce the importance of each professional having to be in their own personal therapy through this training program. And some people keep coming back for more. So out of the 70, participants that we've had in the total of five LLEs. We've had at least 10 of them who have done two and five of them who have done three LLEs. And I've also included members here who are now in the process of becoming the staff. So who are trainees who are functioning as co-facilitators and moving on to be a part of the full staff team. So what are the significant outcomes of the LLEs that we've done so far? One is that we've definitely, uh, we're sure that we have managed to create a therapeutic environment and the only evidence that I can share without any um, constructive research having done is that there was some evidence for all the five therapeutic principles that Rex has established as an essential part of the therapeutic environment. So. I'm sorry that you can't see the picture so clearly, but what I've done here is put, uh, say one of the pictures is of a collective art on the down left, which was done by the community in our third, uh, third living learning experience. And it just shows, so to tell you a short story about it, two artists in the group started drawing from both ends of the canvas and that was on the first day. Everybody else was very scared to go and spoil the canvas, but something happened through the LLE experience that on the second day, everyone was involved, everyone was included, and that sort of establishes that there is a sense of inclusion, there is a sense of attachment, there is a sense of containment and communication where people found that it was all right to discuss their troubles, their issues, their emotions in a very open and safe environment. And people found that it was very easy for them to take the freedom, take the liberty to just be by themselves, explore who they are. Because we are in the middle of nowhere, there are no phone networks, so people are in a way forced to be with themselves. But by the second evening, it becomes not a force, a privilege that they get that space to come away from the city for three days. The next outcome which is very significant as I see it is developing the concept of therapeutic community in the head. This is basically because usually uh, the living learning experience is a training program for people who wish to go on to becoming a staff in a therapeutic community. In India as of now we do not have any functional therapeutic communities. So that is a part of our treatment projects but because there is no therapeutic community to go back and work in. 
what these students do with the experience of the LLEs, at least try and imbibe the experience, the therapeutic community principles in their individual work, in their group psychotherapy work. They accept the idea that I'm not going into a session with the authority of providing solutions to somebody's problems. So it brings the therapist and the client at an equal level, which is still a matter of hierarchy in, in a larger context in India. And the third outcome, as I also mentioned earlier, is demand for personal therapy. So out of the 70 participants in five LLEs, we have at least 20 of the participants who have now started their individual psychotherapy with us. And that's a significant percentage considering the very little emphasis that universities place on personal work for students in postgraduate psychology. And lastly, how do we want to take it forward? So we don't want to limit the participation of living learning experiences to only students or only psychologists or only psychiatrists. We want to make it open for all mental health professionals first. As we are now entering the rural area for spreading awareness in mental health, we also want to work with women in the rural area so that they are going to be people who take the programs to the interior parts of the villages. We want to work with children and ado adolescents in the child protection services and government school teachers who are very closely working with these children. And the idea here is to then probably modify the format of small therapy groups with small activity-based therapy groups, which eventually will end up giving everybody the same experience. That's very little about Indian LEDs. Thank you. Rex? Okay. Thank you, Sean. Okay. Uh, that's great. Okay. So, the next part I'm going to talk about is uh, research. Uh, and I think it's a, almost a product of this globalization I've been talking about, that medical research has become very standardized across the world. And the only language that everybody understands is numbers. Statistics and graphs can be understood without much translation. And those of us who work in complex interpersonal and relational systems do a lot of things that cannot be measured in numbers, which you've been hearing about. And also, many scientific and biomedical psychiatrists say that only type 1 evidence is good enough, and type 1 in, is the hier in the hierarchy of evidence means a meta-analysis of high-quality randomized control trials. Can I ask how many psychiatrists have we here today? Quite a few. So this is the section that, uh, please, please listen, listen to this bit. <laughs> As I've already said, the British government's chief psychiatrist, who used to work in the, the office where the community of communities was, he said we were an evidence-free zone. So this is for him, really. And I've always been worried that um, therapeutic communities don't have randomized control trials. There are, in many ways, there are many ethical problems and methodological problems for, do, for doing a meaningful exp experimental study, and as well as the sort of whole bluntness of the response of the answer which is sort of yes or no without much um, subtlety or understanding but I'm also aware that without that sort of evidence we are going to be an evidence-free zone in the in the in the wider world and so um, I was on the government's um, group for borderline personality disorder that wrote the nice guidelines a few years ago and it was very clear that Unless we had that evidence, it was not going to, the treatment was not going to count. So things like dialectical behavior therapy and um, mentalization-based therapy and now the STEPS program and schema-focused schema groups all have done randomized control trials. And so I think we in therapeutic communities, although we're different to a, met those in, in a fundamental way, I think we have to um, get satisfactory evidence for ourselves as well. The volume of research is growing, and it's particularly true for uh, emotional instability, borderline personality that is, is our own field. And I think we'll become invisible unless we have that evidence. So I came around to thinking that we need to treat this like a, a sort of annoying game that we have to play. Um, and we have to play it in order to communicate that TC's work is a scientific fact, not just as a, a sort of human process that we, we're thinking we feel that most of it is. I mean, I don't doubt that people in TCs 
uh, benefit in some way or other, and also that people can be harmed by it sometimes, and we need to be precise about what, what we're doing. Um, so in the last few years, I've been watching from about, uh, from about 40 kilometers away as my colleague Steve Pierce, here is a picture of Steve. Um, Steve Pierce, who's with strange eyes in this picture. As he's, um, he, Steve and I are good friends for many years. Um, he's been learning the rules of this evidence game and running a scientific randomized control trial, a uh, randomized control trial for democratic therapeutic communities for personality disorder. And the first results are being published in the British Journal of Psychiatry in the next few weeks. So please look out, look, look out for them. They're generally positive. And, and he's going to do longer term follow up in a year or two. And I think those will be even more impressive as, uh, as um, figures to demonstrate that therapeutic communities work when compared with no treatment as normal um, in a randomized control trial. Okay. Um, there's a couple of th uh, things I need to say more about research. I think it isn't just up to a few people to do research, like Steve. We all need to be thinking about the right sort of evidence to collect and the right sort of data collection to do. Um, I think there need to be more trials in the next few years to back up the first one. And research is never finished because there's always more we need to know. So we need to test out the first results and then gather enough to meta-analyze them. And we, we need to sort of think together about that, those of us in the therapeutic community world, as well as doing high quality qualitative research to give those numbers some real meaning as well. I think the two need to be tied together. So the other sort of slightly um, less experimental form of research is I think we should all be routinely collecting measures that matter, matter to, not matter to um, scientists as it were, but matter to the people who come to the programs. Do these, do, do these outcomes matter to you? Are we doing something that is helping in your life? And I think that's likely to have a, a positive response. So I don't think therapeutic communities can survive in the long term unless we're doing, showing that we're doing something that works. And I think Steve in this study and hopefully others in the future will, will add to that acceptable evidence base so that therapeutic communities will be shown as a complex treatment, you know, very complex treatment for very complex type problems that, that deserve a place in health services for these sort of mental health problems. Okay, that's the end of the research section. I'm now going to move on to innovation. I think a lot has changed um, in therapeutic communities over the last few years. We've, in, in the UK at least, we've, we've lost the um, total immersion of residential TCs from the men mental health services. Uh, the Henderson Hospital was a, a famous community set up after the Second World War and that has now been closed. And many others have been set up that are growing up as charities and cooperatives, but not usually residential. In the state sector, the, um, the field is very highly regulated, and it's becoming very difficult for therapeutic communities to flourish. But sometimes they, there are different ways in which they do that, and I just want to say a few of these. They're not all like traditional TCs, and some of them have features and qualities that reflect the underlying values without being full therapeutic communities. The dose has been reduced over the last few years, so it's gone from being residential, uh, then to being uh, every day, five days a week, and then three days a week. And now we're doing one in Slough. This is our yurt in which we do, a, we do therapeutic group, which only meets for three hours every week, and then it joins up with all sorts of other activities that are part of people's therapeutic program. So people make a pick and mixture of different parts to make up their therapeutic community with one one group we all have together each week. And some people call it a micro TC because it's only two hours a week. And some people call it a macro TC because it actually includes all sorts of other things throughout the town. So that's a modification of doing therapeutic communities in a different way. And there's other ideas. We've had, um, we've had conversations with colleagues in South America, in, um, in uh, Colombia, and in Sicily, and a strange church in Deal that don't always, ha always have buildings or even staff. They have a a, 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 a sense of being together and a way of organizing themselves that, as Sharma was talking about, the, the therapeutic community in the head is what matters. And it's the sort of relationships around you that are the things that, are, that you carry in your head. But this is the inside of our therapy group in the, in the yurt that we have in, in Slough. And then I think this is the therapeutic community in the head. There's a concept I want to get across. Now, in 2007, 
we started to look hard at what have become our core standards, what therapeutic communities do that are special and not many other places do. And they're still the central part of this network I've talked about, the therapeutic, uh, the community of communities and all the accreditation process we have for that. But after a while, we recognize there are values behind these that don't need to exist in all those structures. So this is more about the therapeutic community in the head again. And we called these the core values. And these are the values that underlay the standards. You didn't have to be a TC to have them, but all TCs did have them, and many other places too. And these were therapeutic environments, so we called them enabling environments. And that became a project at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And that's a very successful project because we've now over uh, 200 members, mostly in uh, prison settings and, and hostels. Um, and the staff there are finding a new purpose in their jobs. People are offending less. There is much less violence. And because the environments are becoming um, more enabling, more, more human, more relational. And, and so there's um, 10 values that we've set up behind that. And these are the 10 values. Belonging, boundaries, communication, development, involvement, safety, structure, empowerment, leadership, and openness. These are on the website. I won't go through them in, in details. And we've got standards which go with those values and flexible criteria that show how a unit is, is demonstrating those. And people submit a portfolio of evidence. They don't have an inspection. Um, and it's a, again, it's a collaborative process where people help each other uh, to meet them. And because of the success of this, the, the, the head of the British Prison Service, he's now saying that all prisons should be enabling environments meeting these standards. Um, and we want to set up, we've started a process now to see if we can set up a similar sort of awareness of enabling environments and therapeutic environments in the health service in the UK. I don't know how that'll go, we're just starting it at the moment. Last, uh, last thing I want to do talking about this enabling environments is to hand over to Aldo for a minute or two because Aldo is going to explain how this links to our, our um, training program in the LLE workshops. So here is Aldo and the real thing. That's the picture of me, and there you are, the Italian That's the connection. picture of me, anyway. Okay. Now, uh, we're very late, so basically uh, I had the chance of becoming an advisor for the EE um, National Health and, um, Royal College of Psychiatrists Service. Um, so I did uh, a training, and I realized that the workshop that I've been doing for nearly 15 years now, uh, actually reflects the same standards. So I decided to check whether uh, the 34 items that qualify the 10 standards uh, are actually recognized by participants in the workshop. And that's, that's, what, that's what we we've done. Um, uh, so you, you can read this question, but basically I want to go and show you the figures, which is the most important thing that I want to uh, tell you about. Now, these figures before uh, mentioning and uh, showing them to you, they are the result of a very fortunate uh, 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 chain of events. We, this year, uh, not this year, we had 40, uh, six workshop. Actually, November, no, no, it was uh, April 2016. You know, this year we had six workshops, and I applied, it, I gave, distributed the questionnaires, and so we had a, a good enough number, would you say, of uh, participants and, uh, and uh, responses to the questionnaire. And this is the result. Uh, this is the questionnaire, okay, which reproduces the standard. You've seen it earlier on. Okay. Here we are. As you can see, um, the blue bars show the yes. It means a recognition that uh, principles and uh, um, the item, quality items, were present. And the, the orange uh, bar show the no or not applicable uh, reply. So this speaks for itself. Um, I think that now LLE should be regarded uh, as the, the basic tool to show and uh, what uh, enabling environment principles are all about 
I think that's the best training tool to, to help people understand something that goes beyond words. And uh, I hope that uh, NHS uh, administrator, health administrators, would be, uh, would be coming to these workshops because this workshop highlights something very important. The connectedness is what makes us healthy. And I think we need healthy uh, administrators to think about s solution to problems. I don't want to take more time, and uh, let's leave it at that. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll come to the conclusion very quickly now. I've told you what we're doing in Britain, and other people have told you, Aldo about Italy, Sharma about India, um, about what we're doing to help the therapeutic community movement survive. So we're, we're showing that we do it well, and we share that we do it well through the quality standards. We're showing that we train people to really understand what groups and therapeutic communities are through the living learning experience, which you've heard quite a lot about. We've shown that there are people who are doing the serious research that's needed to show that this is an evidence-based treatment. And we're using the ideas in new ways. We're using the therapeutic community fundamental ideas in new ways to help develop outside the, the narrow field that we started in. So I think that what we have in our history, which in some ways goes back hundreds of years, it's too valuable to lose in the modern world of regulation and audit and everything, of mistrust and of fear. And so we need to work very hard to show that there's a different way that we can live our lives and a better way that we can be with each other. And I'd be very interested to hear and have more discussion about how this looks in Portugal. So thank you very much for listening to us.